everyone. Welcome to Hanratty's Huddle. I'm Rob Adams. He's Terry Hanratty, and it has been a while since I've sat in this seat. It is good to see you, first of all. Good to be with you on this. I've missed you guys. On this Labor Day, the start of our Labor Day weekend, it's great. that Our, our compatriot there, Mr. David there, and he is up in uh, Saratoga. He's watching the ponies. And he's watching his, his uh, horse run yesterday, came in second, so they he, Mr. Toromio is doing very well, so that's good. Dave Toromio, we miss you, but we'll we'll get a show going with you uh, sooner rather than later. But uh, Terry, you know, as, as we get going, th- th- once you hit late August, early September, it's almost like a new year in football world. I, I realize, you know, there's training camp, there's preseason games, but it's kind of like September first, college football. Really getting off and running. We've had games already here in late late August, and the NFL is right around the corner. It feels like we're starting fresh right now, and the kids are getting going as well. And kids matter in any sport, and that includes football. For sure. And we look at it where our pro team, my Steelers, are getting ready to open up the season. College, my Notre Dame is getting ready to open up the season tomorrow evening. But no one talks about the little guy. No. You know, the, that little league or the Pop Warner, not the Pop Warner, but, uh, you know, the, uh, what, six six to 12-year-old kids. I mean, here in Grants, Connecticut, we call it the GYFL. Or we're up in, we've got the Fairfield County Football League up right. in uh, New Canaan, where I live. Right. And, you know, it's, uh, I had, I, I heard a question on social media. I put up a thing about coaching in, in Little League and, uh, you know, how we've got to get behind the coaches and whatnot. Then one guy replied in a, in a very nice way. He just wanted my my uh, thoughts on it, where he said, "Do you think the, the benefit of you know, playing and getting hurt is worth the teamwork?" And you know, I went into that, and it was very interesting because what when you when you have sports in, in a kid's life that that builds so much for him, kids are going to get. He's worried about kids with getting hurt. Right. Well, I told him, I said, "Listen, kids get hurt skateboarding." Kids get hurt playing hockey. Kids get hurt playing soccer. Kids get hurt playing don't doing everything. Yeah, they do. You can't put a kid in a bubble and see how and see him grow. No. You want to put him in an environment where he's going to be in a team. No, no better sport in the world than football for teamwork. I played baseball. I played basketball. I ran track, and those were all when I was growing up way ahead of football. But those things are really individual sports. You know, when you're playing shortstop. And the balls hit to you. That right fielder really doesn't care what happens. You know, he's sitting there hoping you catch it and hoping you make the throw. Right. But he's not really in the play. And the same thing with the pitcher. When he's pitching the ball, he's trying to get that. He's thrown to the catcher, trying to get that batter out. And the right fielder again, he's waiting for you know. Okay, let's have everything go he's well. He's engaged, but right, he's hoping. Don't hit yeah, it to me. <laughs> exactly. And you, you know, you're especially at that young age. You don't want that ball near you. No, you don't. But in uh, football, you have 11 guys on offense, 11 guys on defense. And if one person on either side of the ball screws up or makes a mistake or gets beat by a better player, the whole team is felt. Oh, yeah. So you really have to – the teamwork – you know, I, if, if I was starting up a business and I needed to get recruit some – I want to maybe get some athletes. I would get offensive linemen and employ them anywhere. But that's what you always say about the draft, too. You would draft an offensive lineman. You yeah. Build your team that way. You build your team because they have five guys and they really do everything. Yeah. You know, I had a lot of success at Notre Dame where all American, on the cover of magazines, here and there, you got all the publicity. But I'll be the first to tell you that I couldn't do it without that great offensive line. No. no I mean, way. and you, you haven't seen a championship team win without a great offensive line. And those guys work so they get no credit. The egos are very small. They're real grunt guys who want to do the work and get the job done. And that's who I would start if I was starting a company. I would employ those kind of guys. But it's it's uh, the little guy. They you got to have the kid play sports. I mean, that's such a you know the academics is one thing. I mean, that's great that you have to have that. Yep. But you have to have the teamwork. You know, I always said you know you get these geniuses here, but unless you have those. C B students to sell that product. 
you know, you're not going to have any success. So you have to have these guys in a t- total team environment. And offensive linemen are always very ego free. They 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 don't care about the credit. You know, they no. leave that to the quarterback, skill position guys. They they just want the grunt work of doing the grind. And because they, they're they're used to working as a team, as right. a unit. If you would put them on a on a ballerina stage, you see all all these five guys would sort of just move in one way, you know, because they have to go that way to yeah. pre- for everything in the game. And so it's it's uh, you know, I I really you know injuries are going to happen. No matter what, you could walk off, step off a curb, and get hit by a car. That's going to happen. Those things, crazy things, happen. But the risk reward for a kid who in a, get into a team environment is so much greater than just worried about getting injured. And yet, we've seen a couple of kids get, you know, frankly killed in, in the past couple of weeks. Uh, I know kid of a kid in I think Georgia, kid in Alabama. How, how do we how do we keep these kids safe, Terry? You can't keep them safe. You can do everything you can and possibly. Yeah. And I think everybody's gone to is getting to that point anyway, where you know when I played, you weren't allowed water. Right. You know you were a right. wuss if you if you needed water. Right. And all of a sudden they realize, That's whoa! True. If we give them water, they'll perform a lot better in practice. <laughs> I mean, it just, it's it's that progression you have there. <laughs> But, uh, you know, kids are going to – it's going to happen. And it's sad that it happens. But there's hundreds of thousands of kids out there playing that, you know, really has to have that outlet. They have to have that team camaraderie. They have that, have that teamwork. And that is so much to build a character in a child. There's so much talk about, you know, stopping kids from playing tackle football at a young age and, and things like that. Are you comfortable with, with where youth football is? I am. I, you know, I coached youth football in New Canaan with my son for yeah. years. Yeah. And we did everything, you know, to help, you know, kids not get hurt. First of all, they have to be in good shape. Sure. That's, you know, that's, you, it's, that's, have you be. have to start with that. And most of these kids are, I mean, they're young and they run around all day long, so they're going to be in good shape anyway. But, uh, no, you have to take, you know, situations and, and just put them in good situations. Uh, and you have to have game plans to do that. And, uh, so it's injuries happen. It's sad that they do, but you know, like I said before, the risk reward is much greater. It, it I I love youth football. I, I get to broadcast it a couple of times a year, and I I love watching the passion of these kids. They're they're so into it. They're so intrigued by it. They're trying to learn the game, and I, I just think youth sports are so important to what we do. And my coaching in football for youth football, I was never above five hundred. No kidding. Oh no, I didn't. It's, and, so and, wins and losses weren't that big. Wins a deal. and losses, I could care less. Yeah, yeah. It was teaching the kids the game, right? You know, I started, you know, way back. It's got to be. So cool. I'm trying to do some quick math there. Many years ago, okay. And <laughs> and this youth football, when my son was in fourth grade, okay. And uh, I started the shotgun snap. <laughs> That's when New Canaan, you, and you can remember, they were just that, you know, power football. Yeah, they were. going to run off tackle, right off tackle, yep. tackle up, and that was about it. But it, the game was evolving where it was, you could see it going to a more op- wide open game. You had to throw the ball. And everybody started going to the shotgun. And I started these kids with shotgun. And it was painful because half the time <laughs> they just sort of rolled it back to the to the quarterback and the, you know you get that sack and you get lost and you go they go okay let's but when the kids reached high school most of my kids started on the high school team that's right yeah and i used to have two kids who were my center and one was right handed one was left handed and if you think about it real and i was very coy about this we would have a split backfield yeah and i would have direct snaps to the to the halfbacks the running backs and, they, you know, the center would just snap it. But if you're a left-handed kid, you couldn't snap it left. It, the angle is not there. Oh, you boy. have to bring it across angle-wise to get it. So I would put one. I, the, the, they could never tell. So when I wanted to pitch to this kid, I put the left-handed center in. Then the right-handed center would go that way. So we we did a little – we got a little cute with it. But we threw the ball a lot. These kids learn how to run pass patterns. They run, you know, many different pass patterns. Yeah. The quarterbacks knew where to look in certain situations. 
the line learn how to pass block. And it was it was nice, to, great to see them evolve. I didn't need to win. That was the, 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 my ego was not there to do that. You want to watch the kids I progress to see these and learn kids the game. Throw that ball and make the catch, and you go, "Wow, it worked! It worked! Yeah. That's the way would, to do it." And so that's a lot of fun. And I just hope coaches, because I saw it a lot, where coaches were just yelling and screaming and yelling and screaming. And there's a great old line that. Uh, that Vince Lombardi. I've heard it, of it. Was, it, was, uh, it was Red Blake, I'm sorry, used. Okay. Way back in the day when he was coaching at Army. Yeah. And he had this assistant coach. And all he did was kept yelling and screaming and yelling and screaming. He called him aside and he said, listen, why don't you start teaching rather than screaming? And that guy was Vince Lombardi. I mean, that's it, though. Yeah. Teach them the game. People want to learn game. the game. And then maybe it'll funnel to their parents because you still have that backlash of, you know, I, I would start every year of practice when I was coaching baseball. I said, listen, there's not a kid here who's going to be the next Derek Jeter. So let's start from there. Yeah. Let's just learn the game of baseball and have some fun. Then I say the same thing in football. There's not a Jim Brown here. You know, then it would just uh, – Try to bring back their expectations. Bring it down and try to raise the kids up. That's Learn the key. to have fun. Learn to have fun. That's the first thing. Yes. Sports is supposed to be fun. Then master it. And one time I was coaching baseball. And I'm, you know, the head coach, I'm coaching third base, you know, give, making sure. Because you got to almost tell every, what to do on every play. Yes, you do. And I just happen to look over to the bench. And I see, you know, I have about five kids on the bench, right? And they all have a big old slice of pizza in their hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, uh, 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 wait a minute. What are you guys doing? I said, who gave them that pizza? And then the mother said, I did, like being very proud of it. Oh, right? no. Oh, no. <laughs> Kids have grease all over their hands. Yeah, and I yeah. go, oh, man. Unless you take a shower, you're not getting in the game. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, those humorous things that happen, so it's fun. How do you assess flag football? Because that's such a big part of football now well i think flag football is good i mean there's no you don't have to play tackle football okay Okay. you know that's that's the whole key yeah you know you can hate football whatever it is you know i'm not trying to push this upon upon anybody but do something and i think flag football for those kids maybe don't want the contact because i've seen kids that don't want to get hit at all sure three years later they're the one doing the hitting right it's you know the kids evolve into these things so let them go. come along slowly. Feed them, feed them, feed them. Then maybe you really got something here. I had one kid. I won't mention his name. He, I had him young. I was probably, you know, sixth grade or something like that. And, I, you know, every kid has to play, I think, nine plays, something okay. like that. Through the yeah, course yeah. Of the game. And there's someone that, on the other team keeping track to make sure you're getting all the kids in. Yeah. And uh, so we got, you know, we're behind in the game. And I said, listen, come on. Get a couple more plays in. No, nope, coach. I got my I got my nine. I counted them. <laughs> That's all I need. That's all I need. Come on. And yeah. And he just, I said, God bless you. You know, sit Good and watch the you. game. Three years later, he's running pass patterns down the middle, catching these long bombs for me. And just, he's playing on defense. He's playing a rush end and crushing into the quarterback and the, and the running backs. And I'm going, wow, is this great to see? I mean. You just let them grow at their own pace. You can't push them. I think that's the important thing is let them grow at their own pace. Yeah. I think that's huge. It really is. And they make their way out of the youth football. They make their way to high school and eventually to college and the NFL. College getting underway as you and I are talking. And North Dakota State giving Colorado all kinds of fits in a game we recently just watched. And... What are your takeaways, not only from a football point of view, but, you know, as NIL hold, you know, hovers over all this, how do, we, how do we look at this new season? Well, that NIL is not attacking North Dakota State. No, it's not. But it's hitting Colorado explain that. big time. Yeah, how? How is it, how is it hitting everyone? Well, it's, it's uh, in North Dakota, you know, it's, it's the big schools, the big names that are, yeah. making, are making the NIL money. Yeah. The highest paid player in college football now is Deion Sanders' son. Yeah. 
who's the quarterback for Colorado. He's very good. Oh, he's very good. He's making $4.7 million. Good grief. He's the highest paid. And Arch Manning, who is Archie's grandson yep. and nephew to Peyton and Eli, mm-hmm. he's playing for Texas, backup quarterback, making $3.8 million. As a backup quarterback. He hasn't played. He hasn't yeah. started yet. Right. And he makes more money than the starting quarterback because he's got the name and he's got all the all the potential. And he's a great quarterback, no doubt. He is, but... But you wonder when the division and the team is going to happen. Yeah. This NIL stuff is all brand new for us. Yes, it you is. Know, this is really the first full-blown year where you're seeing all these numbers publicized and and uh, people are going, wow, wow, Definitely. wow. And I'm going, wow, wow, wow. Sure. But at, at uh, North Dakota State, who's a powerhouse in their... Division two football. I mean, they win the championship almost every year. And a lot of people say they should go to a Division one school, be a Division one school. But they're comfortable in their own skin. They're recruiting two-star kids, maybe a three-star kid. You're not finding any four- or five-star kids right, on North Dakota right. State. So they don't have the expectation of making millions of dollars NIL. I give their coaching staff a lot of credit. They are developing these kids as football players. Yeah, definitely. Because they went toe to toe with Colorado last night, and they, the end they, of the game ended up on the five yard line. And if they had a couple more plays, or you know, another thirty seconds on the clock, they may have punched that thing in and won the game. They gave Colorado fits, no at question Colorado about it. Too. At Colorado, does this speak badly for Colorado? I think it shows. It really shows who they are. Yeah, I think they're they're going to be. A, they have to outscore every team they play. Yeah. And they have some great athletes on that team. Deion Sanders, quarterback, kid, his son is very good. I mean, he's going to be a, you know maybe number one pick next year. Who knows? But he's going to take a cut in pay when he goes to the NFL. But beyond him, he's got a couple of receivers who can play some football. Yeah, that number twelve. What's his name? I forget it now. It's uh... yeah. He he's really good. And he plays uh, offense and defense. He he was all over the field last night, and that kid can play. Um, you know, you find a player like that on your team, you're you're in good shape. Because well, you see that one touchdown catch he made. I mean, he reached. The, it was great coverage. I mean, the, oh, Travis Hunter when he goes to the corner of the end zone, and he kind of reaches around reaches the around the defender. It was incredible. And I'm going, wow, that I don't think I've seen that ever. No, he reached around him and pulled the ball back over, and uh, then he made a couple of tackles where he just come up and knocked the crap out of guys. And he caught, you know, he, he was batting down balls. You don't know what he's going to do in the pros. Right. He could be on either side of the ball. Exactly. Very few of him. But Travis Hunter played well, and I thought Jimmy Horn Jr., the other receiver, yes. both very, very good. That's what they're going to have to do because you saw how North Carolina or uh, North Dakota State ran the ball on him. Yes. Well, when you get bigger, faster, stronger kids, they're going to run the ball on him. And that's the thing I find myself wondering is if North Dakota State is giving Colorado fits in that regard, what does that say for Colorado in the long run? I mean, it's a long season. They'll figure things out. But. They'll, they'll be able to outscore teams that can't score. Yeah. That they can't put up 40 points on the board. You know, they can put up 21, 28 points. That's not going to be enough to beat Colorado. But when they get up against the teams that are you know, highly ranked teams who have both sides of the ball material, you know, then it's going to be. I think it's going to be very difficult for him. I think it's going to be a long year for Colorado. When you see someone like Deion Sanders, who we know is in a different stratosphere, but when he's Coach Prime and he's saying, you know, I'm not going to answer questions from CBS. I'm not going to answer questions from this reporter. You've been in media scrums. How, how do you look at all this? You have to answer everybody's question. That is your job. You have to communicate with the public. And you can't specialize and say, I'm going to do this one or this one. you got to do them all. I mean, if you get someone and there's an absolute jerk, you can obviously you know, push them aside. But you have to, if, if everybody's civil about everything, then you have to talk to everybody. Yeah. And I don't understand why he's doing that and why he's singling out people. Because that just brings some bad vibes towards your team. Right. It looks bad. And, and also it feeds down to the kids. I don't want to talk to that guy. Yeah. Maybe they come out and say that. You know, so you want you want to set the example at all at all stages. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, Notre Dame begins this weekend. What do you think? I am petrified. Are you really? I really am, because we have you know we lost our best offensive lineman. Okay. Left tackle. Yep. I forget his name. He's got, a, and he got hurt a couple weeks ago. Tore his knee up. 
Uh, it's going to happen. You're going to get hurt sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and they pretty much a non-contact drill, so you can't even blame it on violence of football. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, and we have a lot of really good offensive linemen, but they're really young. Mm. We have a f- true freshman starting at left tackle. So, and Texas A&M has some good rush, edge rushers. So it's going to be a real test for these kids. And, you know, we have a, a abundance of tight ends, really good tight ends. So in my theory, what they would have to do would put two tight ends in, right beside the tackles. And if they're going to run a pass play, you got to chip that guy. Chip, give the offensive tackle a little help. Then you chip him, then he, then he can handle him. And if you're going to run the ball, you obviously have another guy out there to block. So it's going to be interesting to see how it's going to be very hot. You know, Texas. Sure. Texas A&M, you know, yeah. You know, end of August is not going to be 75 degrees. So I think, you know, they have the one thing Marcus Freeman has done has really built a lot of depth at Notre Dame, which we have not had in a long time. Yeah. And so I think they're going to be able to rotate a lot of kids in the game so that I think they'll keep them, everybody fresh. But it's going to it's going to come down to the offensive line as we've talked about how many times now. The offensive line dominates the game in every football game. So our, if our young guys get, I think by the middle of the year they're going to be really good. But you have to, I think you have to get. If we get past this game, I think we're going to have a hell of a record. But this, this is going to be a real tester for us. But even a loss, it's not fatal. It's not fatal this early. Yeah. But you, no you loss. Want to set. You want to set a tone. You want to set the tone, and we have a not. We have a few games that are not going to really make us be able to claw up. Right. To get back into the to the real thick of things. So this will be a game. Is is it a must game for Notre Dame? No, but I think we have to win it. What are the surprises you see coming in college football? Do you have a feeling for any surprises this year? I'm anxious to see how these how these teams with these uh, we talked about the big NIL because mm. I think you're going to see you have a potential of seeing teams that you know, are throwing a lot of money at these kids yeah. and and there's, there's no real there's no real guidelines of how much they're getting or, you know, the NFL, you know, as much as these kids are paying, they sort of have a, what they can pay them. Yeah. But now the college with the NIL, they're throwing, who is it? Uh, is it Oklahoma state? Mm-hmm. They're having their thing on the back of their helmets mm-hmm. where they can plug in. I don't know the, 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 uh, the, the modern day, the, the version of what they call it now, but you can, you know, go on a computer and I can donate to that NIL of Oklahoma state. <laughs> I go, Why? It's just it's like gonna, having a barcode back there, yeah. That's what it is, a yeah. barcode. Yeah. And they can have them in the back of their helmet. So you're sitting Crazy. watching TV. I said, oh, I like that guy. I'm going to go boom, boom, boom. Put some money into their NIL. So it's it's really, they're just throwing money at these kids. And you got to realize they're kids. And what a kid. If 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 I was at Notre Dame and you're going to throw all this money at me, I'm not going to save it. You know, I'm as, as, uh, same way they are. I would have spent it. Have some fun. Treat your buddies. But so I just hope that these kids do the right thing. I mean, it's and, and the coaches, it's going to be a difficult. Coaching in college now is going to be so difficult. Oh, yeah. Because you're recruiting 100 kids every year, the kids you have and the kids you got to bring in, because everybody's looking for that next dime. So they got to constantly recruit everybody on that squad. It's going to be exhausting. And you got to see how many coaches can put up with it. I think you're going to see a real turnover in coaches in the next 10 years. If you had to be held down and said, here, you have to name a national champion right now, who do you think wins the national championship this year? Besides Notre Dame. I can't put them in the equation. I'll hold them out for a moment. Uh, i got to think Georgia. I like them a yeah, lot. I think so. I think Alabama. You know, they're always in the mix. Alabama without Nick Saban. Yeah, that's going to be the real test yeah. there. If, yeah. if Nick was there, you've got to include them in it. Yeah. But how the new coach is going to be, I don't know. So Fair enough. I think it's going to be everybody's guess there. But uh, it, that's the beauty of of college football because you're all kids again. Yeah, who knows? You know, they can screw up so bad or they can be so great. Yeah. You know, so it's fun to watch watch them all come together. As we sit here right now, 
You'll probably do the next edition of the podcast. Dave will be back, I'm sure. But before next Thursday, the NFL kicks off, of course. Do you have a feeling in your mind who's who's heading toward the Lombardi Trophy? Is it just the Chiefs' world, and we're all we're all living in it? Well, we've talked a lot on the on the pros and about. I think they should be hit more. They should hit more. And with the old time Steelers, we used to hit every day. Yeah. The offensive line, defensive line are smacking each other. You know, the quarterbacks, obviously, you know, we're got that red shirt on. Don't touch me. You're darn right. You'll break me. But every, <laughs> every everybody else is getting hit, and they're getting used to those thumps. Yeah. And I kept saying, I said, you know, I've said all along, I said, these guys got to see more time in, in uh, preseason. And I told Dave last week, I said, you know, the only the only exception to that rule, I think, is Rodgers. Yes. You know, he's 40 years old. He's coming off an uh, Achilles tendon. That's you know, maybe you can hold him out because he's done a, enough. Right. And they did hold him out, so we'll see the first coming up this, this weekend or next weekend. But uh, then I found out that there's one team that hits a lot. They Man, go away. They go away. You know, we used to, Steelers still go away, but they don't go away and hit anymore. Right. They go up to St. Vincent's College and, you know, no big deal. Kansas City Chiefs. There you go. Andy Reid takes them, you know, to a, a location where there's no problems, where they have their everything set up there, and they have contact every day, and they get them ready for the season. So that I think that's one of the real reasons where Kansas City has such. I think he's a brilliant mind. Yeah, he is. And I've said many times, I wish Notre Dame would go out and spend a couple of days in the off season with Andy Reid and learn how to screen, because he'll he'll screen with anybody, and he'll keep everybody off balance. I think he is far superior to any coach coaching today. And give me the record books, and maybe we'll go back and you know bring in other coaches too. Yeah, he 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 is brilliant. Brandon Ayuk, did you ever see him coming to the Steelers? I the whole time I thought he was just using the Steelers to hold yeah. to get that money. I was afraid of that, and too. it turned out that way. Yep. Because as much as I love my Steelers, he looks at Ayuk, and you say, "Wait a minute, the Forty ers they." got a good shot of winning it sure they they're do. one of the top four teams and no one's talking about the Steelers even even making uh, you know breaking uh Thomas uh uh what I'm a little nervous this is a rough year ahead it's going to be and it's going to be interesting I think I, I think he could have helped the Steelers but I don't think at 130 million dollars no so I think the Steelers need more than one player for 130 Although million. Although I, I do think because the Steelers had Pickens as one receiver, you need that second receiver. Oh, you Ayuk do. Would have been fantastic. It would have been fantastic, but, but that's but that's a guy that you that you would break the bank. Yeah. And you have so many other spots where you got to spend money to bring in talent. The one Be, receiver is not going to make it because the line still is not good no, enough for my taste. It's not there. Yeah. It's definitely not there, and you saw that in the in the preseason. I mean, these yeah. guys made a lot of mistakes. They got beat a lot. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, see the what the Steelers do this year really well. Are in fact, re- I'm going out. There's a reunion coming up in uh, in uh, October. Oh, really? For the 50th year of our first Super Bowl. I was thinking that. And they're inviting all all of us back for that. So it's going to be a lot of fun to see everybody. So and, you're going to go? Oh yeah. Oh, Good. for sure. I love for sure. That. Because there's a lot of guys that. That aren't going to be going because they're not around anymore. It's very sad because you know we have a lot of teammates that we've lost just way too early. So yeah, uh, it's going yeah. to be fun, but it's going to be sad. Time marches on, but uh, hopefully we can get some of those guys right here on this show. We will for sure get them uh, get them to say hello. Fifty years, wow, that that's got to produce great memories. I can't wait to talk to you more about that. That is really something when you think about all the stuff that happened because I I knew the. You know, when I first, my 69, you know, came coming out of Notre Dame, you had a lot of success. We won one national championship and top 10 every year. Coming out, and we have beautiful facilities and all this stuff. In Pittsburgh, you come out, and it's, first of all, we win the first game, beat yep. Detroit in yep. Pittsburgh, then we lose 13 straight. You go, whoa, <laughs> this is, and I just got my ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, the facilities we had, you know, they kept saying that we're building this new stadium. It'll be done next year, you know, Three Rivers. Yep. And uh, we 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 practice in this park, South Park, and they also have horse shows there. 
<laughs> so we're running plays, and you guys, there's many times guys have dove for the ball, caught it, and got up. And you know what horses do on fields, right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, it's all over the guy. <laughs> and we go to shower, and we have the, they bought this one small house. In the basement of that house was the locker room. In the shower, there's about four he- shower heads they put in there. The water came up to the middle of your calf. Oh, no. You know, you used to go to practice, get dressed, go home and shower. Yep. <laughs> so now, you know, things have changed a bit. So uh, we built that into – and you got to get – Chuck Knoll just doesn't get enough credit. No, what he, he, he really what doesn't. What he did in the NFL, what he did for the Steelers, because the Steelers went 40 years without winning anything. Correct. And that was probably – everybody asked, what was your greatest moment with the Steelers? I said, you know, it might be Art Rooney Sr., who started that team, bought it for 25 bucks. That's right. Or 2500 2500 And 40 years later, he's on the podium with Chuck Pete Rozelle accepting the Super Bowl trophy. And it just the, the look in that great Irishman's face was just beautiful. Really was. So humbling. Oh. And he was so humble in that moment. You couldn't tell. After a game, he came in the locker room. Yeah. You couldn't tell whether we won or lost. He went around, shook everybody's hand. Hey, you tried, you did a good job. You tried, you did a good job. None of this stuff where you see these owners coming in now yelling, screaming in locker rooms. And, you know, again, screaming is cheap. Jerry Jones on the sideline would have never happened with Mr. Rooney. Oh, no. Yeah. No that's way. not who he was. <laughs> no. I mean, Art Sr. was, he was, and the whole family's that way. They yeah. really are. I mean, when you talk about the apple not falling far from the tree. That's definitely the the Rooney family. They're wonderful people. They really are. I will tell you for the listeners, if you've never been to the Steelers Hall of Honors Museum at Akershire Stadium, go. It is so worth it. Yeah, it is. It really is. And a lot of good material to work with. Yeah. Yeah, tremendous. I want to go back. I didn't get enough time there the time that I visited. So uh, it is so great to see you, my friend. I'm glad we did this. Yeah, Rob, it's been a while, man. Been a while. Let's do this again. Nice and easy. Exactly. We'll see you next week. I'm sure Dave will be right back here, but maybe I'll be around a little more often. Football is back. For Terry Hanratty, I'm Rob Adams. Thanks for listening to Hanratty's Huddle.